Mediocre Hobbies Podcast, Season 2, Episode 3, Hammer the Backlog, follow us online, Andy is at, youtube.com forward slash mediocre hobbies, Tom is at instagram.com forward slash tom.landy.hobby, Mick is at www.hammerthebacklog.com. Hey guys, welcome back to the Mediocre Hobbies Podcast, episode three of season two. Uh, we have our first guest on the show. It is uh, Mick Leonard from Hammer the Backlog. He's a very special guest, a longtime friend, an incredible painter. And we will put links to all of his uh, cool endeavors below. He's an incredible Instagram. He has a really funny blog. I'm not going to lie, you're actually the only blog that I've ever read, and I found it quite funny. So I've been reading it ever since, so big thank you for that. Um, and we're going to be talking to him today about his bizarre method for getting through his backlog, uh, hence the name. I'm sure we will get off topic many times and talk about some other things, depending on how Tom wants to actually edit this thing. Oh, look yeah, at I, you. I'm look at the... you with your bright white light. With yeah, my no, big, no, shiny no, forehead. We both have big, shiny foreheads. It's... He's the he's the odd one out now. He's just red. <laughs> wow. Hang on, I can wow. I can adjust. Don't wow. even You're go ahead, Andy. Wait. What? What? I was just gonna say this is our first time interviewing someone, so mostly oh, we're cool. just gonna chat rubbish at you. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Most of the time, I most of the time, I'm at Dark Eldar Codex and. <laughs> I uh, I don't know if I have any Dark Eldar handy, but Dark Eldar. Look, I don't want to. Sp- are, are we recording? No, is, always. Have we started? Always. Right. Oh yeah, he's he's always recording. I don't know if um I don't want to spend my load before we do the the actual podcast. But dark. Oh Elder no, well, I, none of this usually goes in. This is normally just when Andy scratches his face and complains about something, and then it cuts to him actually doing an intro, which yeah, he doesn't do till the very end. I don't complain. <laughs> he complains about quality of this and the sound of that, or some other nonsense. The worst. Well, I've got a pretty nice setup, so you should be okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's just gonna say yours is quite nice yourself. Like what what is the set of four normally? I have been podcasting for years, years and years and years. Um I have a podcast called Sure Look, Sure Listen that's been running for about seven years. Um I did not um, know this. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. Well, it's not it's not Warhammer related in any way. We do have an occasional Warhammer episode. It's pop culture, it's movies and comic books and TV shows. Um oh. but that has like, I don't know, five hundred episodes. And we um we have another podcast called Collecting Issues, which is a, a comic book book club. And like that. that's pretty cool. Then we also do um, you know, the Comic Con cosplay videos and stuff like that. Yep. 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 We do those too. So I've got I mean half of this room is audio is audio visual equipment. So uh, I don't know if you remember when I offered to send you some mics. But yes. that was a, that was a genuine offer. Like I, I'm probably one of the few people you know who just has spare mics lying about. If you have spare mics, then I'll take a spare mic. There you go. Like there's a nice spare Yeti. This is we call this this where I'm sitting now. This is on Shomra Bug, the tiny room. Yeah, uh, that's the name of our production company. Nice. Um, Beautiful. So you know this is this is just the it was the spare room in my house, but is now. Uh, is now here. Hold on, I'll give you a little tour. It's now a terrifying shrine <laughs> to all of the mad shit that I collect. Yeah, <laughs> there's a few bits and pieces there. And yeah, yeah, that's only okay. half of it as well. So there's Transformers as well. There's retro video games. There's comics. There's Warhammer stuff there in in all of these, and all the box games and all are up there on the top. So it's a uh, I mean, this bit is definitely going in because it really does set the scene. It's a shrine. It's a shrine to uh, having a bit of a personality where you just flit around between things and, and can never focus on one thing, um, which is kind of the point of the Hammer the Backlog thing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I really like that as a whole kind of key concept. Like, I've thought about it before, like, not in a real way, like, I didn't want this to happen, but you sometimes you think, like, I just committed a light enough crime that I went to jail for like two years and they let me take my Warhammer with me, man. Maybe I can get through my backlog. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, yeah, I thought of that. I thought like that would be great. And, you know, all through the years, like obviously my backlog is way smaller than yours because you are a completionist collector, essentially. And I tended to be a little bit more focused, but not focused. Focus is the wrong word. Um, restrained. I think a little bit restrained, yeah. <laughs> just yeah. a tiny bit of restraint. But um, 
I always thought of it as like when I'm 60, I can retire and I have the rest of my life's entertainment planned out. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. And then I and then I thought to myself, why why wait? Like what's the point in waiting? I've got all of these things, everything that I've ever bought for Warhammer. At some stage, I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Yep. Yep. And I'm going to start painting it now. And I'm going to start enjoying it now. Have you found the hammer of the backlog has, has been like, are you enjoying the process? Well, you see, the my, my whole thing on enjoying the process is you can't chase the dragon of wanting to enjoy every single minute of it. So there's bits of it now that I don't enjoy. Like there's there's aspects of, say, Blackstone Fortress where I bought it and I was two weeks into painting browns and greys and blacks on Chaos Cultists. And I was like, oh my God, this is a slog. But the whole thing while doing that is remembering, one, when I bought these, I thought they were literally the coolest thing in the world. Yeah. I yeah. hop, skipped and jumped down to Liffey Street and said, give me that box set. <laughs> and I and I went home with it. And then I put it on a shelf for two years and lost interest. And the real thing about getting the process going is you you reconnect with what you thought was cool about that thing at that time. Yeah. And use that to feed the progress and the excitement of, of getting it done. So the actual process, no, it's not always enjoyable. But overall the the rewarding feeling of getting things done first of all is just massive yeah and then the the kind of getting into the mindset of remembering what you thought was cool about this has been yeah. the most important thing about about it for me so you know i didn't want to paint for negative old cultists and then i thought when i saw them though i was like they were amazing look at those guys with all the wiggly bits sticking out of them this is going to be so exciting and tapping back into that is kind of the key to it, getting yeah. that yeah. getting that feeling back, getting that um that excitement. So yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm always trying to remind myself, and it's kind of the point of the whole thing. Yeah. Is remembering the fun. Yeah. I mean there's there's the weird this really cool exercise that we used to do when we worked there. And it was all about like generating excitement and stuff for certain things. And like the exercise was tell me your least favorite army that exists in the shop right now. So you pick whatever it is that you're like, I have no interest in. It's like, okay, if you had to do that army, what would you do? Yeah. And you would That's suddenly true. find these people being like, I would never do this army. But if I did, I was like this unit and that unit would be cool. And I paint them like this and I play them like, and before you know it, they're suddenly excited about it. Like I think people forget how much it's like you said, the excitement that you tap into is the really important thing. Yeah. I really did like that sentence, you know, at, at one point when you bought this, you thought it was the coolest thing ever. Exactly, exactly. And then you put it away. And like, I mean, I'm painting things that I bought in 1996, 1997. And tapping back into that feeling of, I can't wait to get this home, pop it open, spend a couple of hours painting of it, and it's going to look like that box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, though, it doesn't because no. it takes <laughs> it takes years of practice and skill and patience. But um, being able to now paint to, I'd say I'm about as good a painter as the box artists were in the nineties. So I would, I would say you're a bit better than that. Well, I mean, there are technical advantages now. Painting is easier now because we have better brushes, better paints, better mediums, better. Uh, it's not a mystic art anymore. You don't have to yeah, be yeah, yeah, that exactly. magical person, right? Exactly. It's it's and I mean, YouTube, YouTube, like the likes of Andy's channel. Just imagine if we'd had that in the 90s. Imagine what painting would look like now if we had an extra 30 years of people like Andy teaching people the the first couple of steps, because yeah. well, like all you had was still images in White Dwarf or in the in the free brochures that came with the games. Yeah, and it yeah. said, now apply this color, now apply this color. Pretend you didn't notice that we've done seven or eight extra steps there because we're wizards. I never noticed that. I didn't notice that until <laughs> it was pointed out to me like last year or the year before. It, I just never looked at them enough, I don't think. But it, it was, I agree yeah. with you. It was that old joke about, which I can put in the video, draw the L, you know, draw two circles, draw the rest yeah. of the L, L complete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? yeah. It's the joke, yeah. right? And like when you work there, you do get that a lot as well. Because they used to put like six paints as the recommended paints on the back of the box. So someone would walk up and was like, so if I buy these six paints, that's all I need. And you're like, no. no. Why are they showing you these paints? 
I don't know. <laughs> I some literally the, have no idea. Some of them aren't even the colors. No. <laughs> it's purple. I think the, the thing about the YouTube or even just the internet is like the accessibility of having a search engine. Like there was a million great painting articles back in the day, but they were in white dwarfs. And it's like, oh, you got one or two white dwarfs a, a year, or maybe you did get them. But even it's like, okay, I need to know how to paint green cloak. I wonder which one of my stack of white dwarfs might have something to do with green cloaks in it and find a paint. Unless you were one of those really organized people, like cut them all out and stuff. That's exactly what I did. That's, yeah. that, that's, <laughs> that's how why I taught... you're a better painter than average people. That's how I taught myself to paint was um, white dwarf masterclasses, um, oh, wow. the heavy metal white masterclass of white dwarf. And the key to like taking a, a little bit of a step up from what I was doing before that was just trying to replicate people who were better than me. That so was that's, it, like. that's exactly what I've done with the new masterclasses through Warhammer Plus. So I painted my um, avatar cane all with contrast paints, but yep. I watched there what is it, hour, hour and a half video on how to paint it properly first. And I literally just said, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to use, you know, Blood Angel Red or whatever it is. And that was just my my step up. But it's exactly the same thing. If you look at it, you go, I can't do that. But what I can do is this. I'm going to give it a go. Mm -hmm. But I mean, even, even again, to go back to the difference between books and magazines, there were incredible articles back in those. But look at like a mediocre hobbies video. There are some things which are subtextual that it's just impossible to get across in a magazine. Like when I'm watching a video, I can see how the paint flows from, from the artist's brush onto the model. I can see how thickly they've put on the, um, the undercoat. I can see how they're holding it. Yeah, how they're I holding think that's the real one is how do you hold a brush? The brush, the model, the, everything. I can see, like, I can see... Are they using little dotty strokes or are they using a big brush load with full strokes? It's it's a much easier medium to learn painting from because it's so visual and because the motion is there. Yeah. And the motion, you can't underestimate that motion. No, I think that's like one of the big things for me is I never really learned a lot from painting articles. That never really did it for me. It was the videos. Like I still remember the first time I painted something and I was like, Man, this is about as close to the box art as I'll ever get with painting something. And it was uh, the Scions when they were released. Yeah. And Duncan did a two part video. And it was like, it was like 25 to 30 minutes on like base coats and shades. And then like 25 to 30 minutes on layering it. And I like, if, if I go back and I'm going to repaint more of my Scions, I'm just going to literally rewatch those videos. And I followed it step by step. By the end of it, I was like, oh my God, this looks great. And then they did one on the Toroxes as well. And did three of the Toroxes. And I was like, by the end, I was like, they look like the box now they don't but to me they did like i was like yeah. i am proud of this <laughs> um, that was um the thunderhawk blue thor torox yeah. wasn't it yeah. yeah 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 i i bought that box set because of those videos they're so um, good they were amazing yep really great and really um i mean duncan was a big kind of early step in this wave of great painting tutorials on yeah. online yeah i know he does get a lot of credit so i'm not saying he doesn't get a lot of credit but Games Workshop's efforts on that and finding the right people for it were yeah. like that yeah. was a stroke of either luck or genius. Well, if you're listening to any of the, like the Peachy's podcast episodes on his thing, it seems to be a lot of luck to be honest. Like, yeah. Not, yeah. Like Duncan didn't know how to do it or didn't want to do it. Like he wasn't, didn't want to be a celeb. But uh, even in today, I don't know what's today's video, but the one I was watching of their podcast today, they were talking about even like back in the day doing the articles, like someone would come along and like give the layout of a book. And they have like the picture of the model and then they would have three boxes and then the line to the plasma gun. And then <laughs> Peachy would be like, no, no, it's, it's my, my thing is four steps. And he's like, oh no, I can just do three or sixes. So you can either take it down a step or you can go to six steps. And he's like, that's not how it works. Yeah. Four <laughs> steps for me to pick. What are you stupid? Like, and I, uh, yeah. I really like some of the stories that they told about, because obviously they would get their models resin cast as the initial ones that would go on the box art. And they would just get a bag of resin like it came from from like China Forge. And they would have to assemble some things like like some of the worst things I've ever built, uh, like uh, Screaming Bell or the Doom Wheel. And you just get these bits that I can't put together properly with the instructions. Like my yeah. fingers always get glued into, a, you know, onto the wheel as I'm doing it. These guys had to build these kits from nothing yeah, and then paint them in six steps or three steps when there's actually 12. Just, it's, yeah, it, it, 
to try Crazy. to be absolutely insane. I remember we had a visitor over. It was the Trish girl, the sculptor painter mm. lady. She did a visit to Games Workshop years ago. Um, and when she was over, we were actually talking about that, that the masters are all resin. And I was like, all of them. And she was like, all but one. The blood letter master, the one where it's holding the sword and its hand is about to grasp. They mm. never pulled a cast that the fingers stayed on. They all snapped off and they were just like, we could oh, never. Wow. So they had to wait weeks until the plastic ones came. And then they were like, okay, now we can paint one. because <laughs> <laughs> Such fragile pieces. It's insane. Well, she was a nice lady. You can um you can see I, I one this is this is apropos of nothing this is a bit of a diversion but I've listened well, like, to your podcast before and I know you're totally fine with that we love a diversion <laughs> but, um I I like the fact that you can now see if you've got the eye for it and the interest in it you can see that a lot of the heavy metal box art artwork is on three D prints yeah yep you can just about see those layer lines on yeah. the occasional weapon and things like that so the the heavy metal team are painting uh, masters of oh. Sorry. Yeah, he does that. He does that sometimes. <laughs> He's actually just a rainbow. It's to show oh. his uh, support. <laughs> yeah. No, um, and to be honest, we, we talked about this before. I don't know if I put it in the show, but I've got a Mars 2 Pro. And the if you illegally get files for an uh, Imperial Knight, the chassis of the Imperial Knight is the exact width of the build plate. Mm -hmm. So my theory is that when they were designing this knight, the biggest they could do was the biggest they could print. So that's why it's the size it is. Not because makes, it couldn't be bigger, but because they couldn't physically test it. So makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. I think that's you know, there's it's it's not like it's cheating. It's not like it's something they should be hiding. It's just that's how masters are produced these days. Yeah. yeah. Masters are produced with additive manufacturing and 3D printing is a hell of a lot better way to do it than making a making a green stuff model and then casting that in metal and then keeping that metal as a blank to recast other ones off. It's yeah. Yeah. much more effective like i was talking to ali morrison before about this kind of thing and he was like like before i went to full digital where they were just basically digitally like creating things digitally no green stuff no sculpting when they had the access to 3d printers and stuff in the studio they would sculpt like he was like okay i need to sculpt this model okay i'm gonna sculpt his legs okay now i'm gonna scan his legs and print 10 of them mm -hmm. and then i'm gonna design bodies on top of that all right now i'm going to scan that and print that and then i'm going to do the arm so he's not like thumbing the soft resins or bending he, he's just like okay the legs are perfect now i don't have to touch those masters again they're scanned in now and he just basically keeps repeating the process and it's like same torso cool now when i have a belt this way and this one a little chip that way and that one cool get rid of it next and it was such a clever way of he loved it but he also talked about the fact that he was like the oldest generation that existed in the studio that converted over to he was like most people in my generation or before they all left as soon as it all went to digital because they just couldn't learn the skills yeah yeah. No. and you guys know that the oldest or the first fully 3d design model was the black templar vehicle accessory kit from like 2006 2007 oh wow the one that had the rhino doors and the yeah. land raider doors and all the bits that was the very first one because essentially it was flat right so they could do it that's insane. Like, I didn't realize it went back that far. Oh, yeah. Right, uh, yeah, right I mean, back. And now you look at Horus Ascended, who's, you know, we, we've just had all, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've just had all of the Primarchs done by hand. And now that they're done, he's like learned how to use computers and he's done Horus Ascended. And it's like, yeah, I guess we're going to do them all again, right? Because yeah. <laughs> Start again. so much better. Start again. Yeah. We just I, ran out of them. We were making so much money on them. What do we do? Yeah. Well, they'll just have to reboot the franchise. You know, they'll have to just move around which Primarchs were on which side and just, you know, wipe the whole universe like Marvel does every 20 years. I mean, it makes sense, right? I mean, <laughs> it'll be fine. The yeah. big, um, the big difficult, I have a 3D printer as well. I think everybody who's in this hobby kind of semi-seriously does at this stage. Um, yeah, but the big thing for me is it clashes so much with the whole ethos of my Hammer the Backlog thing. Yes. Where I now have access to essentially almost infinite free models yeah andy i think Should this guy's I a want. pro he's brought us right back to topic yes. <laughs> like he's he's not only gone back to topic but knew where he was going with it i'm yeah. starting to get the feeling that you have potentially this is actually an interview for him to replace me on the podcast <laughs> um, <laughs> and i just wasn't informed <laughs> even more mediocre hobbies <laughs> <laughs> so yeah sorry more infinite models available infinite free models available and yep. oh my god it's tempting and fun yes and my whole thing being get you know find the joy in the things that you already have find the 
the love and the things you already have. But then look at these chaos dwarfs and I can just print them out and then they're on my desk and they look yeah. incredible. It's Tom, good. you you personally have been responsible for one of my biggest temptations because uh, after all of your I'm not getting a 3D, <laughs> thank you. After all of this, I'm not going to get a 3D printer. Then you were printing off some somewhat battlefield gothic like spaceships. Um, and yeah, they're amazing. Incredible. Just incredible. And it, it overlaps so many of my interests of scale models and sci fi and spaceships. And, you know, spaceships about that size. It's so just... for context, not only did I print them off, I printed off two whole fleets, shipped, including markers and like little torpedoes and everything. Uh, built them all. I say built them all, drill holes in them so they go on flight stands, which mm -hmm. I also printed because I didn't have flight stands, and then stuck them in an, in an envelope and sent it to my mate Dave, who lives in, in Derby. And then, as of recording, about two months ago, I flew to London and we went to Bad Moon Cafe and we played uh, Age of Sigma on the day and Battle Gothic in the evening. And it's it awesome. was the most complicated game like it's great but you do <laughs> not remember how tough it is anyone who's watching who says oh it's a great game it is you've not played it in 20 years you need to read the rules again it's mental but my god was it fun and to be someone who didn't even have flight stands mm. and then i had a fleet and then i had two fleets and like i was painting mine up in secret it's just it was great well i've um Glorious. i've in the same way accumulated a chaos dwarf army um there's something about that retro 90s, slightly soft, slightly handcrafted yep. roughness that takes to 3D printing very well. Like I've yeah. seen people printing incredible modern sci-fi miniatures with bladed edges and sharp bits, and they sometimes break. But 90s models were designed not to break because, you know, they didn't have the technology to be making such fine edges. So... These axes on these guys are so thick yeah, that yeah. they really take to 3D printing just incredibly well. And yeah, it's just a constant nightmare now, a constant battle with myself to not keep printing armies that yep. I then have to add on to the end of the project and make yep. make the project never ending. I'm trying to not print anything that isn't like a sponsor thing at the moment because that, that like scratches that itch for me. But like it, it's it's damn near constant that you see something that you want. And I like I'm subscribed to a couple of the monthly setup things. So mm. like every month I'm like, here's a billion things you should print. And I'm like, oh my God, I should print. No, no. Yeah. But I should print it. But I should but I should. Like this is the last this is for a video that I'm doing at the moment. But this is the awesome. Oh, nice. yeah. 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 What are you gonna count him as though? Uh a, a Krieg Imperial Knight. Nice. And Andy, um, I think you you were saying you're subscribed to all of the ones like this month, sexy tau. Well, of course, yes. <laughs> Next no. month, <laughs> sexy Averlanders. Oh. I I actually subscribe and unsubscribe from Patreons very regularly to kind of get a thing that I can't get elsewhere. And mm -hmm. I like I like some of them are absolutely awesome. Uh, there's one guy who I've subscribed to for a few months now. I think his name's Wilf W I L P H, but he's the guy who's done the. The Terminators I did and those uh, Space Marines I posted on my Instagram the other day. And he just does marks of armor that don't exist. And he does alternative sculpts for things. He's done some incredible, like, Sisters of Silence alternatives. Very, very simple. Just amazing. I'm just going to print loads of them because that's, as part of the Horus Heresy plan, I'm just going to have, like, one custody and a couple of Sisters of Silence. And they'll just be Space Marines because the whole army is just going to be Space Marines. But it's going to look crazy because I can do that. I can just have one. That's fine. Tom, will you finish that though? Will you finish that project before you move on to the next project? Will you finish that Hor Horus Heritage project? Will you do that whole army and then pick another thing? Or will you do what 99% of the people in the hobby do? Print it, undercoat it, do two units, get distracted by Dark Eldar. So I did, uh, hey. for the same guy I, I built and painted the... <laughs> Uh, a non-specific thing there, not no, no, no. But this is, I, I, I think I've decided I like a project. I think that's what I like more than anything else. I like a single project. So I convinced my mate Dave, who I printed printed the ships for, that we have to play Heresy, and he was like, "Cool." So when the Heresy box came out, he just sent me a box of it and like some bits, and so in a week, I painted him a whole uh, Iron Warriors army. How cool! So that was 
uh, April, or, or maybe I'm um, not April because it was summertime. It was it July last year, maybe? And I just had a week and I just painted it all. And then at Christmas, oh, I don't have it around me, do I? Oh, I do. Did you lose your Warhound? <laughs> <There's> <laughs> yeah. the... No, there's the. Oh, yeah, the glaive. The, the glaive, yeah. Which I haven't done any work on for a while, but it's a legitimate Forge World glaive that another friend of ours was just going to get rid of. And I was like, oh, no, I could paint that for Div. And so it's going to get done. And it's like, got to that stage in about an hour and a half. And so when I get around to my army, I'm literally just going to figure out the units. Everyone's going to have a name, whether it's on their base or it's just like, you know, unit two, marine five, whatever it is. And I'm just going to have all of the Imperial Fists together, the guys that have jump packs, the guys that are combat, the guys that are this, I'm just going to paint 40 Imperial Fists or whatever it is. And then I'm going to paint 20 Blood Angels. And then I'm going to paint... So it'll feel like I'm not working on one project as well, which is the nice thing about this. And I think to bring it back to topic, when you were doing your fifth edition fantasy box with the Bretonians and Lizardmen, mm -hmm. yeah. I bet it feels the same because you know, you're not trying to build an army. You want to match as close as you can to the box art what the Bretonian men at arms look like or what the skinks look like. And then you would go and do another unit, right? Like you weren't just hammering through everything in one faction. And also Bretonians, right? If you want a faction where you can do whatever you want, mm -hmm. every single character is different. Every single thing is unique. It's totally interesting. That's my theory as to how I'll do it. Realistically, no, of course I'll print 17 more things and <laughs> like 54 more things. I've got a Redemptor Dreadnought downstairs. Like, you know what I mean? <clears throat> that doesn't fit in, but yeah, it's cool. Tell them your idea for the sergeants. Ah, that's my favorite part about it. Oh, yeah. So um, I don't know if you've read the latest Horus Heresy books, but there's a bunch of characters and they're just kind of running around, essentially like veteran sergeants. Like you get like um, Zephon from the um, Dominion Zephon from Blood Angels and you get Fafnir Rand from the Imperial Fists and they're just kind of hanging out being veteran sergeants. So I'm just going to get all of the characters I can and they're just going to lead units. I might even get oh, like a awesome. Loken and just have him lead a unit as a veteran sergeant because they're all there. They're all doing nothing else. So such a great excuse to put so many beautiful models on the table and they're supposed to be there and it feels right. I love it. <laughs> the idea. It's going to yeah, be good. That's, that's cool. Um, the, the Bretonian thing though, it's, it's Bretonians are fun because you can you know, paint a different thing every week. But also, yeah. sometimes that's not that much fun. <laughs> sometimes it's great <laughs> to be able to say, okay, I'm doing five red and black uh, archers. And then next week I'm doing five red and black archers. And then the following week I'm doing five red and black archers. And now I'm really good at painting red and black archers. <laughs> and like then another, out. yeah, and then you run out. But like it gets <laughs> to the stage where w one of the things I really like about this, this kind of method I'm using where I break them into discrete, batches for for not quite batch painting but like five 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 yep um the first batch is hard because you're yeah, trying to achieve a kind of standard and you're trying to maintain that standard but you're at the same time you're learning and you've given yourself a deadline so you're going what is that is that a pouch is that a finger what's uh what's going on around the belt area but then when you get onto the third or fourth set of the same five models, and mm -hmm. this doesn't really happen with modern models because every modern model is unique. But when yep. you're dealing with kind of up to about 2008 and they were fairly monopose, fairly standard, by the time you've learned a model, you can paint it in your sleep. I, I We had an electricity cut one of the days <laughs> I was painting skinks and it didn't stop me. I was in candlelight painting skinks. And my lovely lady friend asked me, do you not need to see... And I, you know what? Unironically, I'm not joking. No, I don't need to see. I've done so many of these to the same exact standard over the last month. I, could, I couldn't do it with my eyes closed because I'd missed the model. But I didn't need to know what I was painting or where the highlights go or anything. It was, it was almost muscle memory, which is... Uh, it's I think you're describing something that Andy hasn't experienced for, what, like a year now, Andy? And he's just trying to get to the end of this one model. And then maybe he picks up something on a stream and he does Black Templars or something. But everything else is just, oh, Vashtor, oh, oh, the next thing, oh, Grandmaster's Ariel. Oh. Yeah, literally. It's just the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next. So, like, it's really hard to find time to do, like, get my backlog. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you have, you know, as a kind of prominent content creator, you now have exterior targets set for you pretty much 
And not necessarily that companies are coming to you and saying, hey, Andy, you better paint this or break your legs. But um, that company went out of business. They were very, <laughs> very threatening. Um, <laughs> but um, it's the, you kind of have to, I guess, be on trend and be yeah. modern and, you know, be um, keeping up with things. Yeah. And that is something on my project I not only don't have to do, have to is the wrong word, obviously, because you're not, as yeah. I say, they're not, they're not holding you hostage. This is part of what you want to do. But there's no exterior pressure on me other than the pressure I put on myself to pick what I'm going to paint next. Yeah. But that's really challenging, too, because when I'm posting retro Warhammer stuff, I happen to have kind of stumbled into that niche. That's what I was yeah. going to ask you, yeah. And when I'm posting that, I'm like top 1% of content creators on Reddit and like Instagram just spikes up and the blog. I, when I'm doing Bretonian blog posts, the blog's getting 2000 visits a month, which wow. is a lot for an old school blog. Yeah. An actual yeah. blog that people have to sit down at their computer and read. And then if I post Blackstone Fortress, if I post Chaos Space Marines, if I post Dark Eldar, whoop. Yeah. Yeah, And it's a constant battle with myself to remind myself I am not in this to become a content creator. Yeah, I am in this to get my backlog painted to a degree that is keeping me happy and satisfied and I'm enjoying. All right, guys, thank you for sticking around for another episode of the Media Probably podcast. We had a fantastic guest, Mick Leonard. I would be more than happy to have him back for many more episodes if he is interested. It's quite an interesting guy, and I think we could have spent many more hours talking about the hobby. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure you give it a like, ask us questions below in the comments, and make sure you check out Mr. Leonard with all the links below. Give him a follow and a like and a read of his blog and all that jazz. So thank you guys so much. I'll see you in next week's episode.